Uh, hello again, and welcome. Uh, today I will be talking about how neurons in the cortex represent information. Uh, we know that neurons emit pulses of binary code, known as action potentials, and the question is, what do they mean? How is information encoded into action potentials, and how do the dendrites decode that information and make use of it? Okay. Our journey starts in the 1950s and 60s when a pair of researchers by the names of Hubel and Wiesel uh, stuck a bunch of electrodes into a cat's brain. And at the same time, they forced the cat to look at some images, actually short video clips of, Im of scenes. Um, they were searching for correlations between what the cat is currently looking at and what is happening inside of the cat's visual cortex. And what they found was that neurons in the visual cortex emit action potentials in response to the cat seeing things. Uh, Hubel and Wiesel discovered that the purpose of neurons is to detect things. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize for their seminal work, and their experiments have been replicated many times and expanded upon. Uh, anyways, uh, these neurons are constantly watching over the cat's visual inputs and waiting until the cat sees the object that the, cat, that the neuron is supposed to detect. And then the neuron emits an action potential, which travels throughout the neuron's axonal arbor to the rest of the brain, and that signals to the rest of the brain that the cat is looking at that particular object. Interestingly, they also found that when they showed things to the cat, most of the neurons did not respond by emitting action potentials. Uh, typically, only a few percent of the neurons in the cortex are emitting action potentials at any one moment in time. Uh, this makes sense when you consider that out of all of the things which you could possibly see, you're only seeing a few of them at any one time. And so only a few of the neurons are active. Um, by the way, I'm going to use the term neuron activity to mean that the neuron emits an action potential, uh, and a moment in time in this context is typically about 100 milliseconds, uh, since that's how long it takes for the human visual system to consciously register a visual stimulus. So now let's start to analyze this system. We've established that neurons in the visual cortex detect objects and then they transmit that information to the rest of the brain using action potentials. Uh, so in theory, if we could see the voltage of every axon leaving the visual cortex, then we should be able to decipher what the cat is currently looking at, or at least what the cat thinks it is looking at. But in order to extract that information from the neural activity, we need to understand how that information is embedded into the neural activity. How does neural activity represent information? Okay, so, naively, we might expect each neuron to detect one object. And then there would be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the objects that your brain can detect and the neurons that detect them. Uh, this would make it very easy for other areas of the brain to decode the signals that are being sent to them. Each neuron would have a single very specific meaning, and each neuron could specialize in detecting things very reliably. Uh, this hypothesis is known as the grandmother cell hypothesis. Under this hi hypothesis, there should be a cell in your brain that recognizes your grandmother's face, and her face, and only her face. And there only needs to be one such cell. Uh, at first, this seems like it would be a good arrangement, but there are a few problems with this hypothesis. Uh, there are flaws with this encoding scheme, and we do not see these same flaws in real animals, and so we can conclude that this is not how real animals work. The most obvious problem with the grandmother cell hypothesis is that the maximum number of objects that you would be able to recognize would be equal to the number of neurons in your brain, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between those two things. However, we know that people stop growing new neurons very early in their childhood development, and yet you can continue to learn new things throughout your entire lifetime. Uh, where would the neurons come from to learn those new things? Could it be that you were born with extra neurons that are reserved for later in life? No, scientists have ruled out that possibility. There is no such pool of reserved neurons. 
All of your neurons are being used throughout your entire lifetime, and yet you're able to keep learning new things. Clearly, neurons that have already learned to detect objects are able to learn to detect new objects. This implies that neurons are able to detect multiple different objects. Um, another problem with the grandmother cell hypothesis is that brain cells routinely die. Uh, some people trip and fall and hit their head really hard, and that kills neurons. Uh, but even without concussions, neurons die of natural causes every day. Living cells are fragile, and all successful animals have evolved ways to cope with random cell death. Um, under the grandmother cell hypothesis, when those cells that recognize your grandmother die, you would lose the ability to recognize your grandmother. Uh, we know that this does not happen in real people. Healthy people don't just forget what their grandmother looks like, even if they get hit on their head really hard. Uh, don't get me wrong though, concussions are really bad for your brain, but they don't cause you to completely forget specific facts uh, just like that. So clearly, our naive way of encoding information is wrong. There can't be a one-to-one -one correspondence between neurons and the objects that they detect. Each object needs to be detected by multiple neurons in case some of them die, and each neuron needs to be able to detect multiple objects, or else you won't have enough brain cells to detect everything that you need to detect. Uh, so we've disproved one hypothesis, and we've learned some new constraints on how the brain can encode information. The next waypoint on our journey is the dendrite. Uh, before we can understand how neural activity encodes information, we need to understand how other neurons decode that information. Um, action potentials travel through the axons, shown in purple here, uh, to the synapses, and then at the synapses they cause something called an excitatory postsynaptic potential on the dendrite, or EPSP for short. An EPSP is a brief pulse of electric current, and that raises the voltage of the dendrite by a little bit. When several EPSPs happen at the same time on the same dendrite, their electric currents add up, and together they have a proportionally larger effect on the voltage of the dendrite. Neuroscientists have found that dendrites have some interesting properties. Dendrites are normally not very conductive, meaning that when an EPSP happens on a dendrite, they don't really do anything. The electricity goes nowhere and it quickly leaks away. However, dendrites are full of a special type of ion channel that is voltage activated, and this special ion channel activates, it makes the dendrite much more conductive, uh, which allows the EPSPs to affect the soma and possibly even cause the neuron to emit an action potential. Uh, this phenomenon is known as the dendritic nonlinearity, and sometimes dendrites are described as active dendrites. Uh, normally, the EPSPs sum in a linear fashion, as shown on this portion of the graph. Uh, but when enough EPSPs happen together on the same dendrite, their combined effect is greater than the sum of their individual effects because of the special ion channels. That's shown on this portion of the graph up here. Um, and getting back to our quest to understand information processing in the brain, this dendritic nonlinearity implements a sort of threshold. Uh, typically, this threshold is at around about 10 active synapses. This is, in fact, another piece of evidence against the grandmother cell hypothesis. <sighs> Now let's ask, why does the dendritic threshold exist? What is its purpose? What does it do? What problem does this solve? We've actually already touched upon this. Uh, the answer is that neurons can represent multiple objects. Uh, when a neuron activates, it's a signal to the rest of the brain that the neuron has detected one of the many different objects that the neuron is supposed to detect. And that information alone is very ambiguous, and so it's pretty much useless to the rest of the brain. This is why the dendritic threshold exists, to filter out that information. On the other hand, when a dozen neurons activate, and they all have one object in common that they all represent, then it's very likely that the neuron that that's the actual object that the neurons detected. Uh, let's 
Let's look at an example of this in action. Okay, here is a chart representing a dozen different neurons. Each box shows the objects that the neuron is supposed to detect. This chart should really have about a million more boxes on it, but let's just focus for now on the dozen that I've shown. So, for example, this neuron would represent a house, a tree, or an apple. And this box would represent a neuron that detects a hammer, an apple, or a dog. And this box represents a neuron that detects an apple, a banana, or a fork. So let's suppose that all 12 of these neurons activated all at the same time and no other neurons activated. What do you think it would mean? Notice that all 12 of these neurons represent apple, and apple is the only thing in common that they all represent. So when we see an apple, all 12 of these neurons will activate and send EPSPs downstream to the dendrites that care about apples. The dendrites that care about apples are wired up to these 12 neurons. And when we see a banana, those same dendrites will receive three EPSPs from the three neurons here that also represent bananas. This is the purpose of the dendritic threshold, to differentiate between these two cases, to respond to the true signal and to filter out the noise. Um, there are always going to be a few neurons that, by coincidence, represent both apples and bananas. But the intersection between those two sets of neurons is much smaller than the dendritic threshold, and so activating one set of neurons doesn't accidentally signal that the other object was detected. Okay, now that we understand the basic concepts, it is time to mathematically analyze them. But don't worry, I'm going to keep things simple. First, I need to introduce some new terminology. A sparse distributed representation, or SDR for short, is a vector of Boolean values. This is a list of ones and zeros. Uh, each value in the vector is supposed to represent a neuron. If the neuron emitted an action potential, then it's represented by a 1, and if the neuron was silent, then it's represented by a value of 0. At every moment in time, your brain is generating a new SDR to represent its current activity. Uh, right now, your visual cortex is outputting an SDR, and it represents the objects that you're currently looking at. Formally speaking, an SDR is a vector of n many bits where a many of the bits are ones and the rest of the bits are zeros. The sparsity of the vector is of course the fraction of the bits that are ones, and we're going to assume that the sparsity is always going to be a constant and predetermined value throughout all of our equations, because this assumption simplifies everything. Now let's define the dendrites and the synapses. Each dendrite samples from some of the bits in the SDR, and this sampling process represents the synapses on the dendrite. When the dendrite samples from a 1, that represents an EPSP happening to the dendrite. And if the dendrite receives more EPSPs than the dendritic threshold, then it's going to activate, which is a signal to the rest of the brain that the dendrite detected the thing that it's supposed to detect. Detect. And there is a whole process for deciding exactly which bits that the dendrite should sample from, uh, but that's a whole nother story for another day. Great, let's analyze some properties of SDRs. I have an example here for us to work through. In our example, we have 2,000 neurons, 2,000 bits in our SDR. 40 of those neurons are active at any moment in time. That are, that, those are the 40 ones in our SDR. Uh, each dendrite has 20 synapses, and the dendritic threshold is represented by the symbol here, theta, and that is 12 EPSPs. First, let's count how many unique SDRs exist for any given n and a. The answer is n choose a, where choose is the mathematical operator for counting the number of different ways to select a many different combinations of n elements. Uh, this is another way to write the choose operator, and these exclamation marks here are factorial symbol are, fa are the factorial operator. Uh, for our example here this value is about 10 to the 84th, which is an absurdly large value. For context, there are also about this many atoms in the visible universe. There's actually about, um, 
This is actually about a hundred times larger than the size of the visible universe, but I mean, who's counting? Uh, uh, when you get to things this large, who's really counting? And I, I just want to stress that this is a small example, that the brain has millions and millions and millions of neurons, and that we're dealing with 2,000 neurons. Um, as you get more neurons, this equation simply grows larger. I mean, we only have 2,000 neurons, and we're already in the realm of larger than the visible universe. If you have millions of neurons, I mean, this thing, these representations are basically infinite. Um... Now, not all of those SDRs are actually going to be distinct enough for the dendrites to tell them apart from each other. Because if two SDRs have more active bits in common with each other than the dendritic threshold, then the dendrites are liable to confuse the two SDRs. And the dendrite will activate in response to both of those two SDRs, and then we consider them to be confused with each other. They're not distinct enough for the system to tell them apart then. Uh, in practice, though, this is not really an issue because there are just so many possible SDRs that they usually just don't interfere with each other like this. And this brings us to the next important property of SDRs, and that is that randomly generated SDRs are almost always distinct from each other. The probability that two randomly selected SDRs will have more active bits in common than the dendritic threshold is written here on the board. And for our example, this probability of two SDRs getting confused with each other is less than one in a hundred billion. <sighs> Intuitively, if you generate a random SDR with 2% sparsity, then each bit of the SDR has a 2% chance of being activated. So when we generate a second random SDR, and we're concerned that we might accidentally activate a bit that's already been activated in the first SDR a second time, well, there's about a 2% chance of that happening for each bit that we activate. So if you take a 2% risk 40 times in a row, chances are that you will lose that gamble at least once, and you will accidentally activate a bit that's already been activated. But what are the odds that you lose that low-risk gamble a dozen times out of 40 rounds of gambling? I say 12 times because in our example, that's the dendritic threshold. This property is what allows us to learn new things using old neurons that have already learned a bunch of other stuff. We can select a group of neurons at random to represent a new thing that we want to learn about, and we won't accidentally step on a group of neurons that already represents a different thing. We can randomly generate these vectors all day, every day, for the rest of our lives, and we will basically never collide with an SDR that we've already previously generated. The next important property of SDRs is that they're robust in the face of random cell death. Our example already has some nice big safety factors built into it, which protect us against random cell death, and our example isn't even that large of an example. Uh, as these systems get larger with more neurons and more synapses, they become more resistant to these types of, these sorts of random cell deaths. Um, in our example, each dendrite has 20 synapses, but dendrites really only need 12 EPSPs to meet the dendritic threshold. And so we could lose eight presynaptic cells and still guarantee that all of our dendrites are able to work correctly. Uh, but even if we lose more than eight cells, as long as the cells that die are random and they're not correlated with anything in particular, then chances are that no one SDR that we care about will lose more than a few of its active cells. Um, the intuition here is the same as to why random SDRs rarely interfere with each other. It's very unlikely that random cell death will destroy all of the neurons that represent any one specific object. In our example, if 1% of the neurons died, that's 20 of them, then it could, in theory, disable one of our dendrites. Uh, but the probability of that actually happening in practice is less than one in a trillion. <sighs>
So the final important property of SDRs is that they can be combined together. In the same way that algebraic sets can be unioned together, SDRs can be unioned together as well. Remember that two random SDRs will rarely interfere with each other? One SDR will not accidentally be mistaken for another? Well, we can actually activate two SDRs at the same time, and dendrites that are set up to recognize either one of them will correctly activate, but the other dendrites will not accidentally activate in response to the two SDRs that were activated. This property is useful for representing ambiguous situations, like when you're not sure what you're looking at, so all of the neurons just signal all of the possibilities and hope that one of them is useful, even if clearly they can't all be right. For example, you might see some movement out of the corner of your eye, and it could look like either a shadow cast by a tree blowing in the wind, or it could be the stripes of a tiger. Um, and so your visual cortex uses this union property to signal both possibilities at the same time. It's both a shadow and it's a tiger. And of course, the rest of your brain is going to ignore the shadow and respond to the possibility of a tiger. Um, the key to making these unions work is that even after combining the cells from several SDRs, the resulting SDR must still be very sparse. If there are too many cells active at the same time, then it will start accidentally activating dendrites that it wasn't supposed to, and this puts a limit on the number of SDRs that can be unioned together. I like to visualize what the space of all possible SDRs looks like. I like to imagine SDRs as points on the surface of a very high dimensional sphere. This sphere is centered on the origin, and because our dimensions are Boolean values, the sphere is confined to the positive quadrant. Uh, distances are of course measured using the Hamming distance. The radius of the sphere is the number of active bits in the SDR, which is usually quite sparse, meaning that all of the points on the sphere are actually fairly close to each other, and they're also pretty close to the origin of the sphere. However, the surface area of the sphere is astronomically large because surface area increases exponentially with respect to the number of dimensions in our vector space. Now, imagine that you're standing on the surface of this sphere, and you look around yourself in a circle. How many different directions could you travel in? The answer is the number of different dimensions in our vector space. And so, in our example SDR with 2,000 neurons, or 2,000 dimensions, we would be able to travel in about 2,000 different directions. This allows us to move around without running into anything that already lives on the surface of this sphere. Imagine playing the game Snake on the surface of this sphere. You would never run yourself into a dead end that you couldn't escape from. There would always be another direction you could turn towards to escape. Essentially, you can take any mathematical manifold and map it onto the surface of this high-dimensional sphere. No matter how complex your manifold is, it will basically always fit onto the surface of this sphere, and with lots of extra room to spare for expanding the manifold in the future. And what synapses and dendrites do is they determine if the current SDR is located on a particular patch of the surface of the sphere. They do this by sampling from the dimensions that point towards the sampled patch of the surface area and discarding the rest of the dimensions that are orthogonal to the sampled area. This projects the sphere from a high dimensional space to a much, much lower number of dimensions, like one. And all of the discarded dimensions collapse into the origin and the remaining dimensions get summed together to point in a single direction, and then the dendritic threshold can differentiate between SDRs which are on or near the sampled area and the SDRs which got projected into the origin. We can use this technique of subsampling and thresholding to isolate any patch of the surface area that we want to, if uh, that makes any sense. Anyways, I hope you've learned something interesting, and uh, so until next time, meow.